A Man's Reasons Against Women's Suffrage Remarks by Mr. Frank Foxcroft of Boston before the Judiciary Committee of the Legislature of New York, March 9, 1910. Most women do not want the ballot. The first is that the great majority of women do not want the ballot. The time has long passed when candid suffragettes were able to claim that they were spoke for the sex. They now know better. A member of your honorable body has introduced a bill providing an opportunity for all the women of New York of voting age to express their views upon the grant of the ballot. Have the suffragettes of your state welcomed this short and easy way of obtaining an expression of the opinions of women? Quite the contrary. They have denounced the gentleman who introduced the proposal as an enemy and his bill as a trick and a snare. In the Rhode Island legislature, the other day, a member of the House introduced a bill giving a chance to Rhode Island women to express their views by the casting of sample ballots. He also was furiously denounced by the suffragettes, and the suffrage organizations appointed committees to wait upon him and tell him what they thought of him. In South Dakota, where a suffrage amendment to the Constitution is to be voted on next November, it was proposed that, at primary election in June, a chance be given to the women to vote upon the suffrage question in order that the men of the state might be guided in their vote in November by some knowledge of what the women want. But this suggestion also was vehemently opposed by the suffragettes. The suffragettes believe that the majority of women want the ballot. How are we to account for that fact, always and everywhere, when an attempt is made to ascertain these opinions of women, they vehemently oppose it? Surely there could be no better way of getting the ballot from the hands of men than to make it clear that the majority of women want it. How this was demonstrated in Massachusetts. In my own state of Massachusetts, we are in no doubt as to the position of women. Only 15 years ago, the Massachusetts legislature invited all women of voting age, as well as all men voters to answer, yes or no, to the question, is it expedient that municipal suffrage be granted to women? The suffragettes who tell that they can be met by the casting of a ballot in two minutes on the way to market are no friends either to women or the state. No benefit to women or to the state. My third reason against women's suffrage is that there is no conceivable benefit either to women or the state which would justify forcing upon women a responsibility which they do not want and for which they have had no training. Turn over the statutes of New York. What is there which ought not to be there or what is not there which ought to be there, with reference to which you need the help of women voters and legislatures. The ballot does not affect wages. I know that it is said that if the ballot is given to women in some mysterious way, women's wages will be raised. But if this is so, why does not the ballot raise men's wages? We see continually the struggles of men wage earners to obtain better conditions, but when they succeed, it is by agencies with which the ballot has nothing to do. As a matter of fact, has the ballot raised the wages of women in women's suffragist states? We have negative testimony upon this point from excellent suffrage authority with reference to the most important and populous of the suffrage states, Colorado. Miss Helena Sumner of your state went out to Colorado some time ago to study conditions there with reference to women's suffrage. She went out as a representative of the College Equal Suffrage League. Naturally, she found many cheering things, for it was those she was in search of. But she found other things not so cheering, and in writing her book on equal suffrage, she was too candid to suppress them. Writing upon this question of the ballot and wages, she says, It is probably true that suffrage has nothing to do with the wages of either men or women. As to public employments, Miss Sumner concludes that taking public employment as a whole, women receive considerably lower remuneration than men. With reference to the pay of women, 
Teachers Ms. Sumner makes the surprising statement that not only do women teachers in Colorado receive lower salaries than men, but that the difference in the salaries of men and women teachers in Colorado, instead of being unusually small, is unusually large. Yet it is here, if anywhere, that we should look for some effect of the ballot upon wages, for school teachers are public servants. As to the purification of politics, upon another point also, the supposed effect of women's suffrage in the purification of politics, we get light from Miss Sumner's book, she found in a single county, Arapahoe County, 1,772 women who were fraudulently registered. It is true that, in the same county, the number of men illegally registered was twice as large, but it would appear that considering the short time they have been voting, women have learned how to play the game of politics with considerable rapidity and success. Why does not Kansas extend the suffrage? I cannot touch upon conditions in other suffrage states without entering upon disputed questions, but with reference to the statements regarding Colorado, which I have quoted from this excellent suffrage authority, there is no room for dispute. One other question I want to suggest for consideration in this connection. Women have had full municipal suffrage in the state of Kansas for more than 20 years. If it has worked well, how does it happen that the voters and the legislatures of Kansas have steadily refused to extend the voting privileges of women. In 1894, the voters of Kansas defeated a proposed suffrage amendment to the Constitution by a majority of nearly 35,000. Since then, year after year, legislature after legislature has voted down presidential suffrage bills, constitutional amendments, and every other form of suffrage measure. So far as I know, no suffragist has ever given an explanation of this phenomenon. What would happen to legislation and government? There is one question further which I crave your indulgence for mentioning, a question of expediency. If women are given the ballot, what will be the effect upon legislation and government? Either things will remain as they are, in which case nothing would be gained by admitting women to the ballot, or there will be changes in legislation and government, changes brought about by the vote of the majority of women joined with the vote of the majority of men. Let me take a single illustration. There is now pending before your honorable body a bill which proposes to give women the ballot in local option election in towns. Suppose this bill be enacted. What then? The purpose of those who support it would not be accomplished unless, in some towns, where a majority of men favor license, a minority of men, plus the majority of women, would it have in their power to carry the town for no license. Would this be a good thing? How far can you go in the enforcement of no license in a community where the majority of the men are opposed to it? The same principle holds in regard to other questions. You cannot afford to carry legislation much further than you are sustained by the public sentiment of men. Behind law, there must always be force to make it effective. Women, by the limitations of their sex, are unfitted for the stern work of enforcing law. It would be ill for any state, for any country, where legislation was shaped by women over the heads of a majority of men. Under such conditions, you would soon have not government, but chaos.